So welcome to this webinar on sustainability cricket gear and clothing. Before we go into the main body of the webinar recording, uh, we'd just like to highlight uh, one change that uh, is detailed in the presentation now. Uh, originally, uh, we provided an estimation uh, for waste uh, cricket gear. Uh, but in reviewing our figures again, we recognised there was uh, uh, an arithmetic or a couple of arithmetic errors there. So we have amended this and I'll discuss this later in the presentation. In our final report, the assumptions behind the figures here will be detailed. So without further ado, we'll go into the main body of the webinar recording. Thank you very much. Welcome to this uh, webinar on sustainability cricket gear and clothing. Uh, this is uh, uh, the final webinar associated with two reports that we have been uh, researching from January, January to, uh, to June. And the webinar is brought to you by uh, UCA Business School uh, for Sustainability and the Centre for Sustainable Design at UCA uh, with funding from Research England. Uh, I'll be presenting primarily today or presenting today, uh, but my uh, co-authors uh, for the report are Tom Clark and uh, Joanna Kutznauer. Uh, sorry, Joanna, uh, but they've been unable to uh, present today as Tom has uh, had an operation uh, and Joanna um, is, is sadly ill today. Um, so without further ado, I'll move into the, the discussion and presentation. So before I do that, however, um, one thing that I'll highlight is uh, linked to all of our activities in this area, uh, we drove forward uh, something called the Platform for Acceleration of Sustainable Innovation in, in Cricket, PASIC, in collaboration with BASIS. Uh, and this really is a web-based platform where we're disseminating uh, webinars, uh, research, and we're now in the process of starting some R&D projects uh, linked to sustainability, circularity and cricket gear. And so, for example, the uh, recording of this webinar will be added to the PASIC website. So um, the research findings, I'll get into the, the, the final research findings. So we undertook a range of uh, desk research and some targeted interviews, particularly with, uh, with uh, manufacturers and suppliers. Um, and really that's confirmed a lot of the original uh, uh, research that emerged from the stakeholder meeting uh, July last year, where we found there'd be little consideration of sustainability issues in cricket gear. The, the biggest focus really has been looking at venues, and facilities and the broader uh, sustainability and climate change impact on the game, but very little on sustainable impact of cricket gear and cricket clothing. And it is also confirmed the lack of data in, in most areas. We're seeing a growth in uh, world uh, participation uh, and therefore a growth in, in cricket gear and uh, UK and Wales uh, is perhaps a much smaller market when we compare that, for example, to India and, you know, maybe Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are major changes in the global game at the moment and in England and Wales. And, uh, you know, thinking forward, you know, next year, three, five years, you know, what is going, what are the, what are these impacts going to be on uh, cricket gear and clothing? And really has highlighted, you know, a lack of supply chain data, market data, uh, and data on impacts. Uh, and, and these changes that I mentioned previously, maybe they could act as a, as a driver for more sustainable innovation in the game. And, uh, 
We're certainly picking up uh, increase in media coverage around climate change in cricket, uh, particularly with the, with the uh, recent temperatures, uh, hot, very high temperatures in India and Australia. So cricket participation and growth. So it is, cricket is the world's number two sport. Uh, over 200 million play at some level. Uh, or, uh, so 300 million play at some level. Uh, there has been a projected increase uh, in participation in England, Wales after a decline in recent years. So, so we reckon there's sort of round about 300,000 uh, playing at least once a month. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, this, this obviously is within with England, Wales. So we're talking from uh, in effect from April to to, to September. A couple of uh, other key issues that emerged, which are uh, reinforced by a recent, a very interesting book called Cricketnomics. And this really is the influence of the private school system on cricket, uh, not just in the in the in England, Wales, but also South Africa, Australia, etc. And we reckon that in the in England, Wales is potentially within the season 200,000 uh, over 12 year olds uh, playing cricket in some form, all of whom will need uh, and, and, and do have gear, cricket gear and clothing. Also significant is that 30% of the participation in the game is from the South Asian community. And uh, really we've picked up that ECB have been, England Wales uh, Cricket Board have been trying to increase participation at all sorts of levels. So the implications for cricket gear and sustainability is potentially increased demand, large, you know, 300 million, you know, on a global level uh and, and uh you know increase demands for gear but also particularly you know aligned with a number of other issues in the moment in the uk and the rising cost of living the follow the affordability of playing um not, not just buying gear joining clubs travel to games you know uh subscriptions etc etc coaching so, you know, there is an affordability issue, particularly if we look at some of the price of, of some of the equipment. <clears throat> so structure and governance, major changes in, in the professional game, you know, globally and in England, Wales, uh, there's been perhaps more of a commercialization of the game over the last sort of 10 or so years, shift in the power base, India becoming much more powerful, you know, really the power bases, England, Australia, and, and, and India. Key commercial issues in, in associated with uh, sponsorship and, and some of the broadcasting license, the sort of extraordinary figure being paid recently for uh, the relative broadcasting licenses for the IPL, for example. There's also been changes in club cricket, particularly in the higher echelons in the ECB, uh, a Premier League status and also uh, the minor county structure has, has changed its name recently. There is There are challenges in, in funding the game and, and that's perhaps why we've seen uh, a lot more uh, commercialism coming in uh, and commercial roles at the ECB. Uh, but we can't discount the significance of uh, love of the game uh, by those who are involved or have been involved or play. So there's a huge also voluntary contribu contribution in the game. Uh, now, the, the changes in the governance, the game and the different types of cricket now being uh, played, both uh, particularly in, in the white ball form of the game, you know, um, are, are creating change. Uh, uh, but, you know, there are commercial constraints as to be what, what can be done and, and also constraints at the moment within, you know, regulation in terms of the laws of the game. But again, uh, if we get back down to understanding sustainability impacts uh, of the gear that is new, need to, to, to play the game, and it is one of the most gear intensive sports, uh, we, we reckon. You know, we need much better data to get a, 
a clearer idea of, of those broader sustainability impacts and particularly the waste generated in the sector. We've made some assumptions that I'll come back to later. There are a range of standards that uh, impact on the game, you know, from the MCC laws to several British standards. How are there some sort of questions emerging about whether some of these standards are uh, the British standards are, are still in line with where the game is now. In the, a number of these are maybe 20 years old. And also with the recent uh, British Safety Industry Federation's ruling that uh, softs, gloves, pads, etc., are defined as PPE uh, and therefore subject to class two regulations, it means that uh, those softs uh, now require third party testing. In the previously, it had been uh, testing by manufacturers in, in, in their facilities, uh, but now uh, third party testing is required. So that's quite a significant change uh, and also is adding more costs potentially on the, uh, the, the suppliers of cricket gear. There are also standards uh, for willow grades for bats. So uh, some of the implications, again, you know, in terms of gear, you know, can uh, alternatives for willow be used for bats? If so, what, when and how? And, and University of Cambridge have piloted the development of the bamboo cricket bat to prototype stage uh, and uh, are going through sort of technical and user testing at the moment. Uh, so, so new innovations are emerging. New are there other types of materials that can be used uh, for different types of the gear, and this is an issue that we're particularly going to be exploring in a, in a new project uh, where we're going to look at particularly cricket balls and, 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 and gloves. So, what does the uh, BSIF ruling means for for affordability, affordability waste? If if there is going to be increased costs associated with uh, testing, third party testing, are those going to be passed on to to you know recreational players particularly? So, in terms of suppliers and markets, so there's a plethora of very similar and very expensive market research reports out there, but very little accessible data in the public domain in terms of the overall market size, the, uh, the unit sales, for example, by types of product. Um, there is no industry association for cricket gear. Uh, and it, it therefore, you know, maybe this was a challenge for the sector in, in that perhaps this BSIF ruling was not seen to be coming and, and the sector was rather sort of caught in that sense. So there are different types of suppliers and specialists, you know, domestic, importers, global brands. And we've seen the sort of emergence of craft bat makers over the last few years, often linked to rural communities with a, with a link to, to farms. And, and also what we've picked up is the dominance of J.S. Wright, uh, who, are, who are a significant global supplier of English willow. And English willow is still the preferred um, you know, source of, of, of material uh, for the higher grades of bats. And there's a range of different markets of cricket, you know, from, you know, test to county, right through to, uh, you know, amateur to league friendlies. Then you've got, you know, women's cricket, male cricket, you've got kids cricket. So there's a lot of different elements to the game. So a key issue is better data would lead to uh, increase a better understanding of uh, the production and consumption value chains. There are various supplies of cricket equipment um, and uh, clothing in the UK. And what we made is a first cut at a segmentation of bat makers. Um, and this includes uh, major cricket specialists with a UK base. So, for example, Gunn and Moore, Grays Nichols, and, and, and others. And uh, bats are 
uh, produced uh, in the UK, uh, but some of the processes are outsourced to India as we understand it. The clefts, generally speaking, uh, the willow clefts uh, are generally at the higher end supplied by JS Wright. Um, so the first sort of segment um, is, is um, of suppliers in uh, is, is UK specialists. Then you have uh, cricket specialists from overseas who produce the gear from Kookaburra to, to others. Uh, and uh, they similarly will produce in the country and may outsource some elements uh, to, to third countries or some processes to third countries. We've then got um, lifestyle brands, major sporting goods. Um, and this is an area where we've not really been able to make any great connection with companies. Uh, and these include companies like New Balance, Nike, Puma, who have more of an interest in perhaps the clothing and shoe size of it than in, in bats. So the bats are generally uh, outsourced uh, to various factories in Asia and really the, uh, the uh, logo of the company is added to the bat and perhaps one of the prime vehicles, the bat becomes a major advertising opportunity in terms of uh, the media, you know, attached to major sort of iconic players, you know, Coley or Stokes or, you know, whoever. So the bats often become a vehicle for promotion in that sense. Then we've got the craft bat makers, the new entrants uh, who are started to, starting up uh, bat production, often linked in rural areas uh, with links to uh, willow sourcing. And then we've got the other new entrants of bedroom brands. And we're speculating on this. This is uh, new groups uh, or new small, basically online platforms who source bats from Asia, produce a logo um, and then sell equipment uh, via the website, perhaps to social networks they've built around playing in uh, leagues or, uh, you know, within friendly teams or whatever. So the broadest sustainable impacts associated with cricket gear and clothing are quite diverse, and those impacts, uh, as, you know, occur throughout the life cycle, from the sourcing of the materials used to produce the cricket gear and, and clothing, of which there are multiple materials used in the sector, and this includes resource use, you know, uh, potential air and water pollution, noise pollution in, in outsourced factories uh, uh, and waste. Um, and also there are broader social and ethical issues associated with the production and distribution of gear and clothing. And due to the opaque nature of the supply chains and a lack of understanding of those factories, uh, there is very little information available you know, in terms of the working practices, you know, gender issues, et cetera, within factories. Uh, cricket doesn't have a pledge like football that has, uh, that was developed in the nineties to primarily remove child labor from the production of football. So there is no similar standard in football related to those social issues. Based on expert judgment, and uh, reviewing participation uh, data and use for data, we've come up with a ballpark estimate of 2,150 tonnes of post-consumer waste in England and Wales, in Wales for cricket gear. But this is the first cut uh, and there's a bit more detail in the next slide. Broader issues, particularly in terms of uh, bats, is that a reliance on willow, primarily from England uh, and Kashmir. And of course, that's subject to climate change. It's subject to 
you know, disease, biodiversity issues, etc. So there, if a major disease hit uh, Willow, this would be a big problem for the sector. And of course, we have other issues to do with leather. You know, there's a lot of leather used in uh, cricket gear. Uh, and uh, again, if there are issues there, uh, then there are, are problems, but also maybe there's some opportunities. And uh, we're, for example, starting to uh, explore the potential use of vegan leather uh, as a substitute for bovine leather for cricket in cricket gear. And there has been speculation that cricket is the sport that's most affected by climate change. We have seen the recent uh, extreme temperatures in India, uh, Pakistan and Australia that's hit the global media. And indeed, right at the moment in the UK, we do have a lot of heat challenges at the moment. A lot of these issues came to the fore in a report completed by a basis called uh, hitting hitting for six and uh, this really explored many of the issues to do with climate change uh, and cricket. So another key area in terms of impact uh, that we've found uh, significant data gaps um, is in the area of uh, waste uh, generated from from cricket gear and really we found no information at all uh, in, in any uh, sources or any of the interviews on this. So through expert judgment, uh, uh, you know, exploring, you know, participation figures and making some assumptions about the use of cricket gear, uh, we've, uh, you know, made some guesstimates uh, that we provide the assumptions for in our final report that will be uh, produced at the end of July. Uh, but effectively, we believe there's about 400 tonnes of bats coming to the end of life are going to waste, 300 tonnes of balls, 150 tonnes of gloves, 100 tonnes of uh, wicking keeping gloves, pads, about 1,000 tonnes and helmets, 200. So overall, about 2,150 tonnes. As I say, this is a first cut at this. This is based on assumptions, and we really welcome, uh, you know, feedback on this. Anything to help us build a more robust mo model because it is it is missing, and we need much better and clear information on this. And and uh, so, any comments well received. So again, drivers for sustainability, you know, uh, with impact on the cricket gear, climate change, you know, uh, and, and as I mentioned right at the beginning, we've seen this growing uh, discussion in, in media around the world of, of the impact on climate change on cricket, uh, potential government and regulatory drivers. So, you know, in the U in England and Wales, you know, it, uh, with the uh, driving through of net zero, uh, you know, Will this be um, pushed through from DCMS to ECB, through to the counties and other forms of, 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 of funding, you know, that the sector uses from, from government? Uh, there is growing emergence uh, of recognition of um, uh, broader pressures on sustainability across the sporting goods sector overall and a number of uh, the major sporting goods associations are now producing specific sustainability uh, reports. The changing demographic with increased participation uh, now is emerging uh, growth uh, by uh, girls and women, and also some very active programs now growing um, within, within youth and, and, and children. So, for example, the Dynamos program. So the sustainability response by the sector, well, I mean, we had picked up around about 18 months ago that, that we believed that the ICC was uh, recruiting a sustainability manager or corporate responsibility manager, but we haven't been able to connect with that person. We see no reference on the ICC website. Uh, the ECB have uh, employed a sustainability manager 
and uh, you know, and also the ECB ha have got policy statements, uh, but there has been no published strategies, sustainability strategies by the ECB or the MCC to to our knowledge at present. We've seen a couple of the gear manufacturers in the UK started to put up policy statements. Um, uh, but we're not seeing that universally. We're seeing, universally, we're seeing very little reference to sustainability on, uh, you know, websites that, uh, you know, uh, of companies that sell cricket gear and clothing. Some of the uh, Batman, those that produce Batman, uh, bats uh, ha have highlighted, um, you know, that they are plant planting sustainably. So more than one uh, tree, uh, for a tree taken for harvesting. And uh, we've seen some innovation in terms of uh, using uh, offcuts from the glove manufacturing to produce new uh, upcycled glove. But apart from that, relatively little sustainable innovation by suppliers from the sector. You know, the sector being very conservative, very traditional, yet that we do have this quite significant change in the sector with the emergence of the 100, the growing importance of the IPL and other 2020 tournaments around the, the world, T10 tournaments being being launched, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this sort of balance between the change that's going on in the tradition in the game and that, that sort of uh, tightrope that the game is walking a little bit at the moment, so uh, there's relatively few reuse programs we've found um, related to uh, cricket gear in, in uh, England and Wales. So opportunities for innovation. So we know R&D is happening and we know R&D has happened in the past, uh, but, but it's not entirely visible in the public domain. Clearly, we're not a proponent of uh, uh, you know, 100% sustainable products idea, you know, any product or gear or clothing, you know, has to have technical performance uh, to, to be usable. And it's how you balance that technical performance with reduced sustainability impacts. And from other sectors, from our experience, sometimes by asking the sustainability questions, it can lead to new questions that can lead to new innovation. So is the sector open to, to those new questions and the innovation? And there are multiple stakeholders involved in the game, you know, that have an influence on different parts uh, of the game. And, and it's very important to include those different stakeholders, whether it be players, whether it be uh, gear uh, manufacturers, whether, whether it be you know, the regulator, regulators, et cetera, in, in, in the process. And one of the things that we're doing as in the final part of our reports that will be published in the end of the month is we're developing a stakeholder framework that we will be we're happy to share. So um, going on to the second presentation, and as I say, Joanna, unfortunately, are unable to make it today because of, because of illness. So in terms of clothing, particularly, the dominant material used is virgin, virgin polyester, uh, which is a synthetic fiber derived from petroleum. And, and really, polyester is the you know, universally used across many sportswear sectors due to performance, cost, and availability. We identified that uh, some clothing was used by the Indian and Sri Lankan teams, some recycled polyester, uh, clothing was was uh, produced for cricket shirts in India and Sri Lanka, but we've not been able to find any any further detail on that. Warwickshire trialed a 50% bamboo charcoal mix with polyester. We're not clear if they're still using that um, or, or if indeed they stop using that, why, why, they, why they stop using that. So polyester is used in both white, you know, the classic sort of white clothing and also in, in coloured clothing. Uh, and that uh, for white ball uh, uh, games in, in the professional uh, market, if you like, shirts require a polyester brace to print bright the bright colors required. And I mean, 
we're finding also in the women's game that there is this uh, drive um, and interest in more coloured clothing. And to some extent, it appears from our initial research that, you know, there are, you know, even in the leagues, there are some um, uh, teams that have started to use coloured clothing. And even in the sort of friendly type teams, some will also have clothing clothes. So you may have one team with coloured clothing and one wearing wearing whites. So the game game is changing also in that respect as well. So material innovation is needed at scale to compete with virgin polyester. But as we say in a moment, that is the dominant material used for, for clothing. The material and, and, and similar to the, the, the broader cricket gear side, the material supply chain remain, remains very opaque with limited information available around material or fiber or origin of material. So very little transparency on websites associated with clothing. In terms of production, there are two main methods of production. Uh, production for stock with large uh, volume orders placed usually in Asia uh, months in advance uh, of delivery, so producing for stock. And then perhaps within the smaller uh, operators in, in, uh, you know, in, in the sector, on-demand production with smaller quantities uh, and uh, shorter uh, time, uh, time leads, quicker time leads. And that may be also linked particularly to the sort of bedroom brands and some of the new players. Stock production has been primarily for the sort of, uh, let's say the mass market, the white polyester kit. Uh, the country of origin uh, that we've identified to date has been India, uh, China and Bangladesh. Although we also believe that uh, some has been produced in Pakistan, but it, it's it's a little bit unclear at the moment. But this is very un no, there's, there is a lack of transparency, as I mentioned before, in terms of websites, uh, you know, and any and missing information on on you know uh, um, labeling. So UK manufacturing is being used for as was mentioned above, on some on-site production, usually for smaller quantities, which, which, are, which often are then um, uh, that incorporate embroidered or, or are print, you know, with, where the clothes are embroidered or printed with club logos or players' names or initials. Obviously, that's, uh, you know, at a, at a higher level in the professional game, there's, you know, uh, various forms of um, wording, numbers added to clothes uh, but uh, but it is is not so so always so true at, at, a, at a recreational level often you'll have your club logo maybe you'll have a sponsor of the league or, or a local sponsor uh, but uh you know this this printing process creates some is creating some problems uh in that um you know it, it's an obstacle for reuse uh, and, and also for recycling. So there is some customization going on, um, you know, and, and also we've seen the emergence of uh, online club shops in effect, where a producer uh, will align to a club uh, and have an online shop and, 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 you know, players will buy through that online shop. So there's the sort of e-tailing side of this is changing and, um, Perhaps on the high street, you know, it, you, the availability, to, you know, to buy critic gear is diminished. Uh, I, I certainly just as part of the process went into a local sports shop that 10 years ago would have supplied uh, cricket clothing and equipment and they no longer supply any cricket clothing and equipment. Uh, or more broadly, there is no standardized auditing tool for this for the sector. SEDEX was mentioned, uh, but it seems to be the responsibility of uh, individual brands to do to do audits. And, and perhaps because of COVID, maybe some of that auditing has has not been undertaken in uh, the, in the supply chain now you know we'll draw, we can draw our own conclusions as it's if you if if you if you you know you aren't going to be audited for a year whether 
you know, some shortcuts have been taken or by some suppliers, you know, maybe, maybe so, maybe not, you know, but again, this is a, this is a gap in knowledge. So in terms of thinking in the life cycle, uh, thinking in terms of the use phase, we found very little uh, information on the use phase uh, of, of clothing. We know that uh, washing uh, clothes uh, can, any form of clothes can produce a significant number of microfibers uh, and, and sort of uh, there is growing concerns about uh, microfibers, you know, uh, within water systems, you know, rivers, uh, the sea. Uh, and the tightening up of some of these sub washing machines now have filters built into them. But there are, you know, uh, there are issues associated with, uh, you know, washing of, 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 uh, of, of synthetics. There's also quite a significant stored waste issue, both of clothing and other gear, in the sense of past clothing or gloves, etc you know, maybe stored in bags and attics and garages, clothing, scorch stores stored in, in cupboards. Um, when when uh, players particularly change clubs or stop playing, often there's some emotional attachment to, you know, cricket, clear, uh, cricket gear and clothing. You know, you may have your old gloves that you liked that have got rather crusty and have a hole in them, but you still don't really want to flow, throw them away. So, so this issue of stored waste is out there. There are, there are indications that women and girls may be often playing in men's or boys' clothing due to limited options, but we're picking up that a number of manufacturers are starting to more seriously look at uh, sizing, uh, you know, issues both in terms of, of, of uh, clothing and also in terms of, of gear as well. There is also a need for more research in terms of what drives, um, you know, clothing to end of life, you know, typically thinking about, you know, uh, grass stains, you know, holes fit, you know, uh, of clothing, you know, apart from, you know, the, uh, the moving clubs issue. So, um we're seeing you know collection schemes being set up for uh, uh for potential reuse of cricket gear most prominent of this is is laws taverners uh, uh but you know a big issue with this is the majority of the gear is going overseas so you know there has got to be a huge opportunity for reuse within the within the UK and in the city, if we're going to increase participation in, in a city or areas where uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, economic challenges, you know, maybe some of that gear should be, you know, diverted to local schemes. And this, some of these issues are being um, highlighted uh, by the new uh, uh, Freddie Flintoff three uh, three-part documentary where he's he's starting to try and get cricket going in 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 Preston in in Lancashire and this is really uh, bringing up a number of very interesting issues so their reuse is limited both for clothing you know for cricket gear there's uh, two or three players you know out there or stakeholders laws taverners cricket kindness uh, but also uh, uh, batting for change. Um, there is also some informal hand-me-down networks where, you know, maybe young adults may pass to their siblings or, you know, maybe there is some reuse systems go on in, in clubs with people stop playing or size change, etc. But again, it's not been researched at all. Uh, and hi as highlighted, many of the items or the vast majority of the items go overseas. Now, we're not quite sure exactly why that is. Is that because of historical links, uh, you know, to, to different countries? Uh, although we see cricket gear going to non-traditional emerging countries, but, are, uh, you know, are there requirements by some of the manufacturers that some of the gear can't be reused in, in the UK? Um, 
so reuse schemes also particularly for the lord taverners um program they depend on the the clothing being in good condition however this is the clothing may not always uh, be in 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 the best condition but still could be reused as as can a lot of the other gear um so it's really there's really uh, a lack of knowledge about the whole post-use chain of cricket clothing um and and also other gear you know you know are is is cricket clothing being you know donated to charity shops is it going to textiles banks um, or going into domestic waste streams it, it's it's unclear so more broadly you know there's also not there is also, apart from reuse, a, a lack of knowledge about repair and recycling. You know, we have identified that um, there is gloves repair going on in India, for example, but we found no examples of that. We heard some indications of helmet repair going on in the Lord's Taverners, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, warehousing system but we're not quite sure of the processes there uh we're certainly very unclear about any materials recycling associated with the cricket clothing uh we came across very recently an example of um some uh, uh, uh football clothing that had been reprocessed into fibers that were used in gowns and hospitals but again that 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 is a, a recent example, but we've heard no similar examples from from cricket, and only one percent of clothing is 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 uh, recycled anywhere at the moment. So there's there's huge challenges with building that infrastructure, particularly as we move potentially to a new extended producer responsibility scheme for for clothing and apparel. At present, uh, Defra are exploring the policy options. But sportswear, of course, uh, sports clothing and, and sportswear, you know, is likely to come in scope for that uh, for that proposed legislation. Uh, so really, it is unknown what happens to the cricket clothing and, and a lot of the gear when it comes to the end of life. Uh, no information being found to date on materials recycling, as I mentioned earlier. Puma have launched a garment to garment recycling scheme uh, with football shirts. Um, and there could be other learnings from that um, and and there could be other learnings for even from outside the, the sporting sector with some of the innovation that has started to happen in, in in fashion and clothing you know not in terms of the final product but in terms of the, some of the processes that are being used and some of the innovation that's been looked at in terms of fibers etc so as mentioned before glove repair identified in India uh, but not not in 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 the UK. Uh, we we also saw or Joanna saw as as, as she visited the Lord Taverners uh, program, she saw some uh, very you know interesting basic sort of enabling of reuse by new spikes being added to to shoes to enable reuse. So that that's another example of just extent in the life of products so in terms of final disposer no data found you know questions you know are you know is is uh the, the clothing you know whether it's tops trousers jumpers etc ending up in some of those sort of uh the clothing recycled markets in africa or or even some of the the landfill sites in uh you know in in africa or, or south america uh again no real data on this um uh, some ad hoc um conversations with uh, uh a Ghanaian colleague um highlighted that there is definitely various tiers of markets uh in in, in Ghana for football shirts whether it you know be a high price you know Arsenal football shirt coming coming through the chain or a lower uh club level name uh he also speculated that even you know white cricket shirts or um even cricket trousers might be uh used as leisure wear or gym wear or something like that so he he didn't 
kick it out of court that some of the cricket gear may be, um, in, you know, being used as leisure wear in, in third markets. As I mentioned before, you know, recycling generally uh, of clothing is, is at a very rudimentary level, 1%, you know, and so there just isn't the infrastructure, structure, you know, infrastructure, logistics networks to, to, to collect and process at the moment. But maybe with the potential regulation coming in, we'll see, you know, that start new more infrastructure being developed. So again, limited data. So there has been some innovation. You mentioned, uh, as we mentioned earlier, this 50% uh, 50, 50 uh, bamboo charcoal mix, you know, uh, you know, trial by, um, by Warwickshire. And, you know, I mean, it's a question. Do we look at reuse schemes as, as innovation? You know, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it is perhaps relative to the overall uh, cricket system it couldn't be looked at innovation but on another level it, it should be perhaps basic infrastructure there uh, to be put into place to re reuse repair and recycle you know um, cricket clothing gear to extend the life to enable increased participation in, in the game so Grace Nichols have produced upcycled gloves uh, that use production offcuts that they sell commercially. However, due to various, uh, you know, ICC regulations, they're not be able to be used at an international level. So just in closing again, um, please feel free to engage with our PASIC platform. And again, one key issue that I should mention there is that this is a neutral platform you know, this is not an NGO. We're providing uh, objective data on the marketplace. We're looking for people to engage with us and uh, looking to develop further projects. So we really have one project starting to look at vegan, the potential use of vegan leather, you know, in cricket gear, and also to look at the concept of uh, uh, circular cricket gear. So, uh, thank you very much, and uh, we we'll, we we'll look forward to the to the discussion. So, does does anybody have any uh, comments? I mean, or I might just ask people <laughs> randomly. So, um, so Darshal, you're working in. Oh, oh, oh no, I saw Tamara's hand go up. So great, and we can take start. What? So Tamara, hello. Please, uh, Hi. Hi everyone, that was really interesting. Thanks, Martin. Um, just a couple of things that, just a couple of points um, that I just wanted to, I suppose, kind of comment on um, just that came out of some of the things that you said. In terms of the collection schemes, obviously I'm sort of the kind of little sister um, in Cricket Kindness to, you know, not the Lord's Taverners, but, you know, collection schemes, I just want to make the point that they're really only limited by logistics and funding that's the only limitation there's no other limitation and you know I noticed the the sort of figures that you put up in terms of let's say bats um you know I think you quoted a hundred thousand bats you know went to waste um you know in the last few years I've you know this is one person doing it been able to um send out eleven thousand bats so that's almost ten percent it's tons, tons, not tons. bat, not units. That's right. tons. tons. Right. Sorry, tons. Okay. Anyway, I mean, you know, in a, you know, a few short years, I've upcycled seventeen containers. So, and that's mm -hmm. one person. So, mm -hmm. it's literally just um, the will, and also, um, you know, reimagining what our focus is, and maybe you know, people like me collaborating with manufacturers and with. Um, you know, retailers just to make sure that there's no, um, you know, there isn't this extraordinary sort of waste. Um, and I, I just think also, you know, in, I can't, I, I just can't really understand why the research and development isn't going into um, making sure that we can at least recycle some parts through the process you know and then upcycling is obviously another thing where you know it's very it's not not uh, you know unless a bat is completely finished to refurbish a bat isn't so hard to do you know it just takes the will and I, I just think 
you know, I, I'm, I, you know, it's very heartening that you're putting a focus on this um, research because it's just thinking about what our priorities are. That's that you know, as a society, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, and as lovers for this of of the sport and also for our fellow kind of, mm. you know, um, giving people opportunities, basically. Mm. I mean. Great. Well, thanks very much. And you know that, as you're saying, he, and, and I know I know the, the the challenges you've you 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 face there because I also, for my sins, founded a repair cafe uh, that we've uh, had uh, run seventy sessions. Uh, we've had three thousand people through through, which is a charity again. You know, so I I, I know the challenges that you you you, you face. Uh, so, but all. Also, the numbers are very interesting, just the level that you're talking about and, and also the reinforcement um, that uh, from your side, you know, about the lack of information, the lack of, you know, consideration around these issues. And again, both for myself and Tom, who've been working around sustainability and products for 25, 30 years now, we're amazed by the level of the lack of activity, perhaps in this sector today. Mm. Most of the activity, you know, has been at the, the level of the venues, the facilities, more mm. of the macro level that the mm. basis does brilliant work in and, and is seeing huge growth in, in interest and membership. But mm. once you start to look at the actual, the, the gear used to play the game, mm you know vir virtually no research on uh you know on the matters uh to date mm. and and um so do we have any other observations or thoughts or comments yeah P peter yeah so hi everyone um apologies that i know uh, next to nothing about cricket so <laughs> so my my questions may be a bit um bit odd um so in terms of willow um growing forests is, is there like a stewardship certification body for them you know that so they're kind of sustainably grown and things like that sustainably managed also on cricket bats could they be this is a bit odd, odd idea but could they be could old ones be chopped up and then be remolded to make new ones maybe the performance would be slightly lower but as a way of actually reusing the material maybe i'll take the 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 the, the last one and then i'll make a comment on, on the first one and tom will follow up with the correct <laughs> detail there uh, but um so chopping them up i mean i mean there's already a lamination is allowed for kids bats and with it, and maybe Darsha might want to comment on this. That within the bamboo bat that uh, Darsha developed and prototyped technically and in user, that is a lamination. So you could it, it, that is in effect. It's not the term chopped up, but it's modular in that sense. There are components to it in that sense. Now there may be issues with terms of re-gluing. You know. I, Technically, I don't know. It's an interesting idea. Um, we we have seen some some odd reuse uh, or it's sort of aesthetic upcycling where we've seen benches made from old cricket bats and things like that. So there has been some sort of out of sector reuse. In terms of uh, the growing, you know, for I mean, I guess this is a forest stewardship question. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure if you know, uh, that applies to the willow, uh, you know, Tom, what are we, Tom was able to do an interview with JS Wright, who are the uh, prime suppliers of willow in the, in the UK. So what, what are your thoughts there, Tom? Well, um, <clears throat> they're not just prime suppliers in the UK, but they're prime suppliers in the world. So, so about 95% of the world's supply of Willow comes from one supplier, J.S. Wright, who have plantations in East Anglia and con and supply from con from farmers around the country. So it's um and it's not an inherently unsustainable. It's a special type of willow. It's not it's not your old any old weeping willow. 
Um, um, so it's not um, inherently unsustainable in the way it's grown. It can, it can actually be beneficial in um, in growing in, in, in some areas, in, in holding um, uh, water uh, in, in, in the ground. So it's not a bad thing. It, it's, I mean, it's more the risk to if anything should happen to these to these willows. And they they, they are they claim to be planting three for everyone that's harvested. But they take fifteen years to um, um, to mature, and um, <clears throat> and they. Um, and you, you can't tell what what's going to come out. There's a there's a severe shortage of top grade willow, and um, and the prices have been going up. I think they went up fifteen percent per per cleft last year. So <clears throat> it, it's a it's a constraint on the growth and development of the game, and and a, a risk if there was any loss of supply in the future. <clears throat> Question, Peter. Yeah, so in, in terms of the kind of, I was thinking that they'd be really chopped up into kind of quite fine, you know, and then it would be really compression molded into the, so it wouldn't be a laminate, it wouldn't really be a laminate, but they'd be like finely chopped up and then really compressed into the moulded forms and then they could be kind of could be glued yeah, but I mean obviously I don't know what performance yeah would be. No, I, I was just thinking laterally in, in the yeah, same yeah. idea but I mean Darshal are, are you on the call uh you know uh, again it, it's an interesting innovation idea that, that that could be could be thought about I mean again yeah I mean yeah it would require a lot, a lot of thinking R and D. I would say, uh, 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 technically and, and from an innovation point of view. D D Darshal, you know, perhaps maybe it, if you could perhaps mention. A, I mean, I know it's not precisely what Peter's talking about, but something about the laminated process for the bamboo. If you're there. Well, um, so. I mean, th there is a technical paper on the bamboo bat available uh, that goes into, you know, uh, the, the, the the production process that was used um, to produce the prototype. So um, now uh, I can't remember maybe... Uh, yeah, I think I can... Uh... Sorry, uh, I'm not sure who that is. Uh, uh, I, I believe within the laws of the game uh, that at, at this stage, um, there is still a requirement for uh, the bats to be made of wood. And this is a challenge for willow because it's a grass. And secondly, I believe, I'm not quite sure about this lamination process, whether uh, bats for adult use can be uh, laminated. Uh, but I know that bats, uh, laminated bats can be used for for kids cricket um, so there are some, some constraints within the laws of the game are you on Darshul? yeah can you hear me oh it's a bit maybe if you take your camera off it's a bit stretched you know the sound uh, sure yeah is that a bit better yes great yes with the lamination process for the bamboo we were cutting out strips and then gluing them together with uh, different types of res, uh, glues and resins. Eventually we stuck with uh, PVA because that is also used for the handles and assist the biodegradability of the end product. But one of the challenges with the entire lamination process tends to be the more you laminate and as you were mentioning, crushing and compressing, that significantly increases the density of the product. So that, and that is a big parameter or variable that influences um, players' uh, desirability for the equipment. Um, and then there's also the LCA aspect of using 30 to 40% glue in uh, extremely compressed and uh, laminated products. In our case, for the bamboo, we had 5 to 10% of resins, but you, usually if you were using strips or, uh, as you were saying, uh, shredded pieces of timbers, then the resin content would be 30 to 40%. And that significantly influences the 
embodied carbon and the, um, the, the embodied energy of the final product as well. So um, it's not entirely a sustainable reuse of it unless it is a long-term uh, product in the end. So if we envisage the cricket bag to be lasting uh, over five years or so, let's say. Uh, so I think that's something to bear in mind as well. The other aspect is to consider different types of uh, what uh, the crushed timber um, and laminated products would be replacing, uh, whether they would be replacing existing uh, cricket bats in the amateur game using different types of timbers, uh, for example, or not, and whether that would be a sustainable alternative or not. So again, those are sort of some things that we'd have to consider. Yeah, the other, the other just thing building on that is that you've got different performance requirements at different levels of the game so when kids are starting maybe that performance level isn't quite so high so could you actually you know it's not the same point uh, but could you actually cut smaller bats out of larger bats for kids use you know i'm just starting to th use my creative the, the the right side of the brain now uh, but uh, maybe um, Pete, maybe maybe peter we should join in a in a, in a brainstorming session at some um, stage. Martin, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Martin, can I, sorry, can I just say, the answer is yes, you can. Okay. Because, um, there's a, as a random coincidence, there's a, one of the sort of um, back bedroom bat makers who's a teacher at one of my um, children's schools and he's done it for me many times. So yeah, you can do that. <laughs> oh, okay, it, 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 yeah. so, that is, is, so that is that a craftsman who's cut down uh, an, an existing bat into a smaller size for a, for a child? Yeah, very, because it's very, very it's high quality willow, um, but you know, it's, yeah, he's just made it a smaller bat. So yeah, excellent. Uh, do, you, do you have a? Could you send us a photo of that? If yeah, it's I can. Yeah, I'll. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, absolutely. I I hopefully he's he took it sort of every step of the way, you know, photos of the process. But yeah, um, definitely. Can I just say one other thing? When you said in your talk, um, you you weren't sure whether um, the obsolete um, logos necessitated sending gear overseas um, or not, it wasn't clear from your research. Um, I've definitely had firsthand experience where that's been the case um, on a fairly major scale. So if it's, you know, we had a, um, an, an experience in Australia uh, about four years ago where for the first time in 20 years, we had a, um, a change in sponsor of our junior cricket and um, there was masses of kit brand new that needed to be sent overseas. Yeah. Uh, huge scale, you know, four 20 foot, um, four 40 foot shipping containers worth of gear. Yeah, now it's all of these things that are bubbling under the surface that nobody's really picking up in the sector at all. You know, I have very good examples there. And, and again, I, I just happen to know um, uh, the father of the, the, the captain of the um, Surrey uh, women's cricket team. And, and I know this also from you know the performance squads in in, in 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 boys cricket that all sorts of stuff is thrown at these these particularly the 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 young players that is mm -hmm. ends up being just first life gear they they mm -hmm. may use it one a couple of times and then it's just not mm. not used mm -hmm. again yeah so uh, i i just want to say it's not it, like the the uh, it's the opportunities are there so it's not you know it's it's we can paint a very gloomy picture but um of, of this extraordinary waste but there's so many opportunities and i think it's just about the will to you know collaborate and to change and also maybe not to even view um you know or, or projects or initiatives like mine as charitable as actually you know reimagine them as actually you know as well, well, I mean, this, this this is part of what we're looking at and part of our yeah. broader activity. Yeah. We're looking at this through the lens of circular economy and innovation. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so this is the idea of banning the word waste. So what we're about is yeah. about uh, uh, value, uh, retention yeah. in products and components and materials for as long as possible in economic and social systems. Yeah. So it's how we can 
you know, retain, extend the life of the products. If we can't do that, how we can extend the life of the materials mm. into other elements. So we're hundred percent with you and, and, and we should have an, another conversation about that uh, because uh, that's the R and D projects we're now starting to move into. Mm. Uh, so for example, yeah. So we're looking at the potential use of vegan leather, you mm. know, uh, in, in the game. What we're also starting to look at, you know, within the constraints of it, you know, function, performance, etc. what a more circular cricket ball might look like. You know, yes, with the cricket ball, it actually is quite a good example of product life extension because people continue to use it till the seam splits. Mm -hmm. But could you reuse the cork in the middle? Mm -hmm. You know, is that integral cork that's just sitting in the middle of a ball just going straight to landfill which yep. has a potential reuse so we're looking at all of these things and again we're happy to talk to anybody you know around these issues but uh, we we should have a, a particular talk you know tomorrow with your knowledge about you know what what's really going on so do, do we have any other comments or thoughts peter yeah yeah, so on the clothing side, um, so um, a contact of mine, she's just been involved in a, a project, obviously, obviously it's not cricket related, but um, so what they did is that they, it was actually someone had printed some Britney Spears t-shirts, but they spelt it as Brittany rather than Britney. <laughs> and so what they did was overprint them. So I wondered whether you were mentioning about you know people put their clubs logos on their shirts if there's an opportunity for like people to consider when they're designing their logos so they can be designed so they could be over print someone else's yeah, I mean, so then they get to reuse i mean the, these are exactly the innovation things we're starting to explore you know over printing could you change the printing process so the you know the the um, i forget the technical term but those the the logos could be removed you know, and and, um, we, and one of the things there is we're looking outside of the sports sector into the fashion sector, you know, for innovation that's going on in places like Sweden, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we, you know, innovation often comes from outside the, the, the sectors we all know. So that's exactly what we're starting to do is not, not just look at what innovation is going on, for example, in mountaineering <laughs> that we might uh, want to consider because mountaineering is a greener sport because of the nature of it you know the 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 those that engage in it are likely to be greener and we've had companies like patagonia who very strong sustainability ethos since the 90s so could we learn something from mountaineering but also could we also learn something from uh another the 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 fashion and, and clothing brands that are starting to drive innovation because they see more change going on driven by regulation customers etc cetera, etc cetera. so so absolutely exactly the sorts of thing we're starting to look at in the innovation side of this i i spoke to joanna before yeah. this meeting and obviously she was struggling to get information from brands from clothing brands and and that's that's quite typical because they don't have to tell you anything and so they they don't so a way around that could be to actually to actually pretend that you're actually going you're trying to develop a cricket top yourself and then you may be able to find out a lot more information about because i mean i asked her what i mean you said polyester but i mean what type of polyester you know, is it is it staple polyester? Is it microfiber polyester? If it's we're, microfiber polyester, is it flat? Is it Peter, split? Peter. No. We're six months into this research. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're we're now identifying we're in a very tricky area. We're identifying the lack of information. <laughs> we're identifying the challenges. And now we're in the stage of thinking how we're going to get around those challenges. So, yeah, we, you know, six months on, we'll be further down the line. So uh, yeah. I, I, I appreciate the thought uh, and comment, but yeah, we're, we're, we're um, put pushing forward into that. This uh, we'll, We will find a way around some of these things. So 
Um, so maybe just for time, what I like to do, and hopefully everybody will engage with this, is literally go around the, the people in, uh, on, that I've still got on the screen and just tell me one thing that you thought was interesting, one thing you disagreed with, one thing that you thought really wanted to, uh, you know, you'd be interested in more information. And I know this will drive some people off the call, uh, but maybe maybe I'll, I'll run top to bottom here. So uh, Tom's first on my, my, my list there. So Tom, any, any comment from your side? Well, uh, there's any uh, data or information that you can supply will be very helpful. Well, I think we've established it's just not there, but it, it's it's good to um, to hear your ideas on how we can um, increase circularity. Right, so it's been some some good ideas today. So next on my list is is Peter. So yeah, so obviously, so I'm I'm involved in in textiles, but not in synthetics. So, but so I'm always keen to find out exactly what the clothing item is, and so it kind of it's and it's difficult to find out. So for I should I can't think there's anything unique about cricket gear that's not done for any sort of outs, outside sport. So you know I'd want to know what what the treatments are, what the UV treatments are, what the antibacterial treatments are. I'd just like to know what the actual cricket clothing product is. Yeah. Well, maybe we should have a follow-up call at some stage with Joanna and, and yourself, uh, if, you, if you're open to that. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. it is difficult to find out. You've either got yeah. to go to people that have worked in polyester sports, where all they, and there are people at, in the UK yeah. with that, or yeah. you've got to analyze yeah. it or, yeah, or find yeah. someone who's going to tell the information we we will we have our means yeah <laughs> uh so so paul oh yeah um hi yeah, obviously um being a cricket cricket supplier and been in the industry well, our brand's been in the industry for 50 years and i've worked in it for 30 years i found it quite interesting obviously what you guys have been saying and um, I think you'll find uh, this is just a personal thing you'll find in the cricket industry that it's very much a small cottage industry so all the manufacturers that are a very traditional family sort of base run sort of cricket um, cricket suppliers like Grey Nichols, Gunnar Moors, uh, us we're quite a young brand really I mean we've been around 50 years but the old traditional brands you're going to find it very, very hard to get information from them. And I think, although you say cricket is a, a big international sport, which is in terms of watching and, and, and people engaging in it, in terms of sort of sales-wise, it is a very small industry. And that's why I think you find the big multinational brands like uh, Pumas, Adidas, uh, Nike, all those people, New Balance, they come into it just from a marketing point of view, like you've highlighted before. There's also brands like the, the Indian brands like MRF and Sia, who are multinational corporates and who are just using the names of the Tendulkas and the Virat Kohli's as, as brand icons and ambassadors, so which have got no interest in the industry at all. And they're just going to local manufacturers in India and just putting their name on stuff and, and getting the guys to use it. So I think from, from an industry point of view, if you want to get people on side, you know, you've got to look at it from that point of view that, you know, the, the companies are very, very small and the market that, you know, the profits or the market's very, very small. And I think that's probably the lack of innovation within the industry to, to look at sustainability and the costs involved in the research. They just don't have the money to be able to do that. And the big brands, the Pumas and the New Balances, who do have the resources to do that, aren't really bothered in the cricket industry. They're just there to have a Joe Root using their gear or, and as soon as the money men at New Balance and things like that, they just, they'll see the numbers and after three or four years, they'll pull out of the industry. Like Adidas did, New Balance was just coming out of the industry. You've got this new brand Castor that's coming into the marketplace. Um, yeah, I think 
you're just going to find it difficult to get it. But I think the one thing I've sort of taken on board is is the recycling aspect, which I think will probably be your easiest route to sort of make serious changes. But that's got to come from the governing body. So the easy way that I would see it is your national governing bodies around the world. And even at a local level, if you take Worcestershire, where I'm from, or the, the, each each county has got its own board. So there's 40, I think, 40 county boards. If you get those kind of people on board and uh, get some schemes and recycling, that's just going to make a massive difference in terms of recycling kits. Um, I could talk to you a long time about I do going about cricket bat manufacturing because that's our history history and that but maybe that's a time for another time otherwise i'll be on for ages yeah <laughs> no. there's a lot of it there's a huge amount of urban myths around with cricket bats and i think you've touched on about quite a few of them today but like you say people won't talk about it because it's quite an insular industry no but that's great well thanks very much paul for your the feedback it's very very useful to hear that and I, and I mm. that I that that linkage back to the counters is an interesting idea and uh, it's something that Chris and I have sort of touched on a bit and uh, maybe I think, I think they'd all they'd all be keen they'd all if you can't but it's got to come from the national governing body the ECB or whoever they I think they'd be really keen on 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 those sort of projects about recycling all the time because there is huge costs involved Fortuitously, the next person on my screen is Chris Whitaker, who will be able to comment on both those points. Yeah, and I'd, 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 I'd be, um, I don't think the ECB would, would really want to get involved in it because it would be yet another thing that they'd be um, imposing on, on county boards. I think um, you're more likely to do it, at, at, like you said, Paul, at the um, at the very local board level rather than county club level um and, and that would be interesting actually I'm, I'm with kent next week so i'll i'll raise that and, and i'll see what because i think what it would need is one county board to take it on as a kind of cause and then talk to all their um recreational colleagues and, and kind of drive it through that so i'll, I'll see what kind of take up we get from that uh, just commenting about today i think um the one point you made, Martin, about the lack of information is something that everybody here on the call can help with. And I would really urge you know, everybody to get involved in this research and this work that's being done here to provide more kind of granular data that, that we haven't gotten and we haven't, haven't been able to access. I thought what Peter was saying was really interesting about textiles and, and you know, that that's something like we haven't really looked at in any depth and, and having the kind of access to that sort of information would be massively helpful um yeah so and and lastly the fact that there isn't a trade body representing this area of the business to me seems like a massive a miss and a, and a really is something might be worth talking about so paul that might be something where we could um could um start discussing with you to see whether there'd be any merit think, in doing it i, I know I think they they tried to do it years ago and I, I i you know we were quite new into the industry and the the, the old traditional brands that they just don't want to know um no but, but possibly we could yeah. coalesce around sustainability so not mm. you know kind of remove it from the because i understand everyone's competing with each other in in a mm. fairly you know small intense kind of industry right. but maybe it, it, if 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 you think Paul, uh, the quick win may be the recycling and reuse and repair yeah, exactly. side. May, may be a, a specific committee that wasn't competitive, that went across mm -hmm. the sector, maybe yeah. had representatives. And there are models for similar things that are set up in other sectors mm -hmm. that, that just the sector dis decides to agree to, to yeah, work but, as a sector. Yeah, I don't think it's a manufacturer's thing. I think it is a county board who look after their, their specific area. They're going to be the people who interact with the clubs and the players and all those that yeah, are, yeah. they're all on their databases those are the people who are going to the schools and everything they're going to be the people who are going to 
have the people who are going to recycle the product. No, and, and, fact, and, yeah. and, that, and that's a really good point because it's the use phase. You know, it's the post. So in the jargon of life cycle, it's the post use mm -hmm. phase. It's the customers, mm -hmm. the people who are using it. And generally speaking, from our experience of other sectors, you know, often the, the producers will, will sell the product into the chain and, and they mm -hmm. don't know what happens to the product at the end of it. Mm -hmm. That is very common across, we've been doing 21 depth interviews with my colleague Lillian across multiple sectors from big, 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 big names and startups across many sectors. And a lot of the manufacturers cross sector really just have no idea what people do with their products. You know, you know, do they repair it? You know, do they reuse it, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. There's a big, you know, gap. You know, and, and and that's really important in terms of circularity. You know, how you keep the things within the system, extend the life, etc. So that that's not uncommon. So, so, um, so anyway, I'll start waffling on and pass on to Lee, who's got her hand up and is yeah. next on the list anyway. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, fine. Uh, thank you, Martin. And as always, these are these are really interesting uh, conversations to have. Um, the thing I enjoyed today, um, it is good to see a little bit more data coming out. I, I have a few kind of comments and thoughts on this, um, but first, because I know Tamara had a jump um, in talking to her and maybe even Kathy Gibbs can add if she's still on, my understanding from Cr Cricket Kindness Project and also from talking to the Taverners um, Recycle Scheme, some of the counties, like I know Surrey and a couple others are already into that um, and have the bins at, at um, the Oval in various places. I think there is more progress this year getting to more of the county boards on the recycling scheme. Um, so, and I do know from Tamara, I know that she's got kind of, not contracts, they're not contracts, but deals with lots of schools and clubs. Um, I use some of her flyers this year at some of our club, not my, um, clubs, but at my, some of my kids' schools to get things back to like AJ Sports where they were a collection hub. So I think there is some stuff going on. There are some county boards getting on board. Again, Kathy may be able to say if that's an ECB directive or if it's more that the taverners have reached out. Um, so I'll just, I'll just put that there um, as more of a comment on some of the, the discussion going on. Um, a couple pieces that I keep going back to in my own head, um, and I think, Paul, you're right about cricket is big, but it's small. Um, it behaves like its own little beast. Um, there's not always a lot of integration outside of the sport, and there's not a lot of voices in the sport. Um, the one thing, Martin, I think you and I have talked about before, and probably being an original outsider to the sport and from another country, um, I think there's more that we need to do collectively to reach out. You know, Australia does have, it was mentioned earlier, a lot more around sustainability in cricket, at least they're talking about it. I would love to know what they're thinking at uh, the equivalent board level, what their research is showing and what technologies they're looking at. Um, the one we've talked about before, baseball in the US, all of the pads have moved to almost like a Kevlar, almost like a yeah, I'm not saying they're necessarily sustainable and that they're probably made of plastic or whatever, but they are lower impact. They do last longer. They don't get so grotty like cricket pads. Um, I think hockey pads have moved to that too. So I think a lot of sports are tackling the same stuff. Same with the sublimated shirts. I'm kind of pulling my head out, hair out this week because I'm seeing all of this about women are now being told, don't worry, we won't make you wear whites anymore because of your periods. As a woman, um, that really irritates me because if you watch any of the women playing test cricket last week, they were proud as hell to be wearing their whites and periods happen to all of us. I'm wearing white right now. Um, you wear period pants, you know, there's things, there's other things we can be doing. So I, I just feel like quite often we have these very insular conversations and we're not looking beyond you know, there's a lot of this data that you guys you have to keep sharing again and again and again because you don't know who's going to be on these calls. But I think at a certain point, it might be useful to draw a line and say, we're not getting more data. The data doesn't exist or we need to look elsewhere. There's no more in England. Um, and just, there's other countries. That, just, there's other just, sports. Just that, Lee, and, you know, Lee, Lee, we, yeah, let we, me just fin just, let yeah. finish one sentence. Okay. And then people like Peter, you know, Peter, if you're working in other sports, if your job is, you know, interesting, sustainable performance textiles, 
I, for one, want to be talking to you. I mean, the, Lucy talks to lots of people who's my d developer and designer. You know, there's a lot out there beyond us. Um, and I think we do need to go outside our own little patch if we're going to answer some of these questions and, and ride on the coattails of maybe what some other sports have already figured out versus us starting from the beginning. So, so just building on a couple of those points, uh, we, we've started a, a dialogue with ECB, uh, a, a, let's say a, a, a proper meeting <laughs> where we have posed uh, three pages of questions to them. <laughs> they have said they were, they are prepared, you know, to try and deal with some of these data gaps. They have said they are prepared to try and help us uh, if they have the data. So a conversation has started. Um, now, I don't know what will come back from that, you know. Um, so, on, uh, so um, and I, whether they have the data, you know, a number of these areas is, is another issue. Um, so, uh, and, and, and absolutely, you know, the sector can learn from what other sectors are doing. You know, uh, at, at a point in time, I, I will be finishing a 33 chapter book on accelerated sustainability in fashion, clothing and textiles, uh, building on an event I ran two years ago, who brought in, you know, all sorts of people are covering different elements. And at some point in time, when that book is is pulled together we will uh, derive you know knowledge from that that could be applied to this sector i mean there are also broader networks like the materials kt you know knowledge transfer net there's all sorts of stuff out there that people could be talking to uh that, that are outside the sector you know uh, and, and there are people there are many people that we can learn from you know who are doing stuff in, in other places so I absolutely have to step out um, as you say. So last couple of people, I think, on my screen are Lillian. Uh, yes, thank you, Martin. Um, well, I I'm relatively new uh, to cricket and uh, the sports sector, but yeah, um, what I take from uh, today's presentation is primarily, I'm quite surprised to hear about the lack of data, uh, not only within the use phase, but also um, across the, the supply chain. Um, as, as you mentioned uh, previously, I think a lot of companies are struggling at the moment to engage in the user phase. Um, so yeah, no, it, um, it, it's definitely a very uh, interesting uh, research and project to start gaining um, more access to, to um, data that will uh, have an impact on um, product circularity and improving uh, sustainability within uh, the cricket sector. Thanks, Olivia. And Lucy, if you're still there, yeah. I am. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Hi, hi. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the call today. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I think I think this call and the last call definitely re-highlights to me um, that the cricket industry is very slow to to catch on to what the rest of the industry has been doing for over two decades now. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's not only not only talking about sustainability, but actually talking about, and I think, Paul, you hit the nail on the head, really. Um, and Lee repeated it again, which is that cricket is this little niche um, that doesn't fit with, doesn't seem to fit within the rest of some of the bigger sport categories that we have um, in the sports industry as a whole. And I think that's because from a design point of view, when I look at cricket, it really hasn't evolved like some of the other sports. There's not much excitement around the visuals and the aesthetics of cricket. It's sort of, it's been sat in a quite a stuffy, old fashioned, um, you know, um, look for quite a while. And I think that's the purpose of what we're doing at Lacuna is to try and change the status quo on, on what cricket can be. And I think um, one of the shorter, you know, quick term ways to do that was going through teamware and printing, but obviously, um, that is, you know, I think probably to keep things cheap. That's been why that's been done. But I think part of how we can, you know, bring more awareness to actually the cricket world and like Paul, you were saying, to actually wake up some of these some of these brands that have been set in their ways for for a long time now is to is to 
um, change the aesthetics as well and bring some excitement in to to attract people into it. Even though, as you say, Martin, there are you know huge statistics of people who play cricket. Um, you know, when I speak to people in in different um, societies and different sporting worlds, and they say cricket, oh, I don't know anyone who plays cricket. You know, um, and and cricket is 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 a funny little little niche um, that that needs a bit of awakening. Um, and uh, you can see if you if you head over to Lacuna that we're really trying to to set an example by um, not only slowly breaking into a change of design, but also in our brand transparency um, and being completely honest with what we do and how we do it. Um, and it takes time; it's a journey. But um, but what we found is that I think obviously some of the bigger brands what they struggle with is actually backtracking now. That's what a lot of the bigger brands are, are struggling with. Um, and that's where we have a more advantageous, um, you know, first step as a startup is to, to go in um, straight away and, and work on, on more innovative fabrics. Um, and you can see in the first collection that's launched, launched that we've used some really interesting fabrics, mixes of Tencel with recycled elastane, you know, things like this that are, are very different to anything else that's on the market. Um, yeah, so, uh, but happy to, happy to keep providing as much information as we can do as a brand to, to support this. Great, and I, and I think that for any of us, and, and Tom, maybe it will be available on iPlayer in, in um, Australia, is uh, I think this Freddie Flintoff documentary that's just started is, going to, is the real eye-opener, uh, you know, exactly as you've described it, you know, going out, could he develop a club from scratch in a, you know, parts of Preston, um, and literally exactly as you're saying, oh, it's a, it's a, it's it's too posh for us. We play football, you know. Just the reality, the perception outside of perhaps middle class slash public school system, you know. Uh, I, I think this might because it's prime time TV. This is an interest. It's timing. Everything you know, is timing. The timing of these, a variety of things are coming together now. Uh, and this is going, I think this is going to, it's got to create a debate with ECB because it's going to, is showing them, you know, the reality. You're going out, randomly picking a place. I've never heard of cricket. What is it? You know, Freddie Flintoff? Oh, I've never heard of him. You know, uh, so, I, and, and, so I, I think, you've hit the nail on the head or on the participation agenda and uh, the challenges of it being perceived still as a, you know, a, a posh public schoolboys game, even though it's, you know, it is to some extent, but it's not entirely. But you, what did you hand up again, Lucy? Um, I don't know what I was going to say. I think it was just picking up on the point that it, it sits within, you know, it's it's it sits within quite a funny category. Yet yeah, it's what you're saying. It's it's either you know of a poor sort of upper class system that tends to tends to do it, or you know very underprivileged um, kids that play it in um, LEDCs. But there seems to be a huge gap in the market of of a social class that are not interested in cricket. And I think that partly is because of, of somewhat of the lack of excitement of visuals and innovation that has come to the garments in the past decade, in where, when we've seen other sport categories absolutely fly in terms of visuals and, and exciting changes in terms of design. I, th I think there's, there's other things. It's not just the aesthetics. You know, it's often, it's sometimes not seen that. as a boring game. You know, state school doesn't play cricket, they play football. You know, the interesting thing in that documentary you know, it, it's guys from the hood in effect, and they 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 were saying, "Oh, it, 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 it's it's football and interesting." They were saying rugby. Now, rugby also has a perception of being, you know. So that was quite interesting that they didn't see rugby as being posh, but they saw cricket as. So there's, I think, there's a bundle of issues of of which you're you're exactly what you're talking about there. there that, but hopefully this um, this will you know add, add another layer of debate. And and uh, I pronounced your name wrong, but is it Sangram? Sangram, are you still there? Sangram? Sangram, are you there? <laughs> okay, may maybe uh, 
maybe not uh, or listening doesn't want to mention anything but anyway well thank you all very much for the 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 call i think each each of these sessions reveals another layer and, and another set of issues and I, I think the circularity piece is perhaps you know as paul highlighted you know in the earliest conversation i had with ecb you know bearing in mind they have a policy but no written strategy the earliest conversation i had with them was um oh circularity we've not really thought about that so i think i think that might be an area where we can come together with something perhaps uh collectively and and um uh we may well come back to you on that paul if if you're open to a conversation you know uh you know um just even open to a conversation <laughs> about some of these issues uh so um uh so great well thank you very much i don't know if anybody has any last comments to make uh but if not i'll, I'll finish up and um thanks all for your uh attention and interest and, and staying on and your questions always good to have left field questions coming from outside the sector peter I haven't thought about chopping back stuff into into, into sugar cube sized pieces before <laughs> you know, okay uh, in like a parquet floor yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, i mean uh, yeah so anyway great I, I i know we could all carry on, on talking more but i thank everybody very much and we'll catch up with everybody in due course and i will i will re-record the presentation and send it on uh i'll be glad to get out of these these uh get out of june and july with my technology issues anyway uh uh thanks very much and see you again thanks martin thanks, thanks martin bye thank bye, you. bye bye bye